So we are going to be, uh, I'm going to do a single message today, uh, not in the middle of a series or anything. Uh, I just feel like God had put on my heart to, to finish something. And that was that back in October, we had been doing a series called You Asked For It. And one of the topics that we were unable to get to was the one about can you trust the Bible? Like, is the Bible trustworthy? Is that something I can trust? And so today I want to kind of dive into that. I think it's an important discussion because I don't know about you, but it seems that on a regular basis, people are saying that the Bible is not trustworthy, that it's not accurate. It's not historically accurate. It's this, it's that. It's, you know, it's, there's little shaky things here. And because there's little shaky things here or, or apparent, I say apparent contradictions that, 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 you know, that it just really can't be trusted. I don't know if you've ran into that, but perhaps you will at some point. But my point is, is that I want to drill down enough so that you guys can have enough in you to be able to say, wait a second, wait a second. I hear what you're saying, but, but what about this? What about that? Because I think it's important that we do that. Not because it's our job necessarily to defend God. I don't think God needs that. God's fine. He's not really all that concerned. You know, he, he made the place. He's good. He doesn't get nervous when we get clever. You know what I mean? Like he's cool. But I think in the end, us being able to talk about our faith in a healthy way and why we believe it and the purpose of that and all that is really important. And so I wanted to read something out of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 16. And, and, and now I want you to listen to this. Say, listen to this. All scripture, say that. All scripture. Now it doesn't say some, it says all. All scripture is God breathed. Get that. It's God breathed and it is useful. It's not, it's not something you just sit on your shelf. It's actually useful. It's something that can help you in your life if you'll grab hold of it. So it's useful for teaching. So that's what we're doing here. Rebuking. That's when someone comes to you and says, hey, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and you're like, wait a second. Right. And you get mad and offended. No, you guys wouldn't do that. You just say, I receive it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for correcting for training and righteousness so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's why it's there. But the thing that I want you to see is that it says that all scripture is what God breathed. So often we focus on the vehicle at which it came to us. We focus on the men, the scribes, the people that wrote it down. And we look at that and we say, well, because man was involved, it must be messed up. You know, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. But the Bible very clearly says is that God breathed it. So if God breathed it, then we have to understand that there's something happening here that isn't just normal in terms of how a book gets written. There's something different about this book. And so I want to spend a little time talking about what's different about it and why it's important for us. Because there's so many people out there that want to, 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 to tear it down, to, to dissect it to do all kinds of things to get you convinced of something. And that is that this is just a regular old book. And if the enemy can get you convinced that this is just a regular old book, do you think that has any impact on your faith? Do you think that has any impact on what God could do in your life? If you simply outright just reject what he says is his word, I think the enemy would be busy about that. Matter of fact, I think there'd be, the enemy would be raising up all kinds of people to get you convinced that it's not God's word. So today we're going to learn how we can trust the Bible and we can trust that it really is helpful to us and that God breathed it. Because see, your Bible, I believe, can be fully trusted. Listen to this in Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Get that. My words will never pass away. In other words, everything in this world will go back in the box. Everything in this world is going to break down at some point. But what God's word says is that my word will remain true. It's not going anywhere. It's not, even if people say it's not real, it doesn't affect whether or not it is real. It's stationary. It's strong. It's something that we can build our life on. It's not going anywhere. It will never pass away is what the gospel of Matthew tells us. I think that's a big deal. Now, now in, in, in theological world, there's a, there's a term called... Uh, theological world. Isn't that funny? It's like a store we go to, theological world, right? And so if you're going through the theological world and you ran into a section called apologetics, 
Yeah, apologetics would be a section is, that really is about defending the faith. Making sense? And so you're defending the faith. That's what apologetics is. Now, I'm not an apologist. I, I'm probably not smart enough to be an apologist. But there are some men and women out there that are really good at this. And I'll just recommend one in particular. His name is Josh McDowell. And so if you're ever just wanting to kind of do some exploration in this area, the defense of the faith, uh, he's a fabulous person to look up and look after. Uh, he's got a book called an, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And so if you ever want to read it, it's good. Or just have it as a resource. Like, it's one of those books that you, like, you run into some question you didn't know about. It's probably in that book. You know, and, and you just have it on your, on your, on your uh, bookshelf, and, and it'll be there for you. It's just a reference point to help you in your journey. And so a lot of the content today is coming from those giants. You know, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that guy, you know, because, I mean, I, I, matter of fact, I think you should be leery of new ideas when it comes to the Scripture. Because, see, see the, the, the faith is based in something very real, very historic. And it's been going on a long time. Matter of fact, I think the times the church gets in the most danger is when it just gets clever. <laughs> we get too clever, you know, and we start saying, well, maybe we could do this with it and do this. And I'm not against changing models. I'm just not. I'm absolutely against changing our mission, addressing those things that are at core. And so that's what you get with apologetics is these men and women down through the ages that have defended the faith so beautifully. And so Josh McDowell's a good one. I think one of the better Bible teachers in our culture right now is Rick Warren. He has a whole thing on this. And so if you're ever looking for like a Bible study, he has some of that stuff. And it can help you. So I'm just telling you that some of the stuff, I'm giving you the condensed version of some of that stuff. So I, and maybe I'll put a little of me in there, a little spice, just to add it. Okay? Okay. All right, I, I just want to make sure you're with me. I just want to make sure. So today we have seven reasons, seven reasons that your Bible can be trusted. And some of you went, seven? Come on, that's too many. Like, here's the deal. I don't know if I'm going to get to all seven, all right? I'm, I'm just telling you up, in, up front, I'm probably not going to get to all seven. But uh, I, I want to give you as much as I can today. Because this is like a teaching series, you know, it's just a little teaching sermon. And, and so are you guys ready? You got your brain on? Okay, you're hooked in? All right. So I'm going to give you seven reasons, maybe. Number one, the first one is it's historically accurate. Did you know that? Do you know the Bible's historically accurate? Now, I hear people say this all the time. Well, how do you know that? I mean, I mean what about that fish? The swallow that dude. Is that, is that real? Did that really happen? Do you really believe that? I mean, do you believe in superstitions, Pastor? Well, oh, hold on. Look, I understand that there are things in the Bible that seem crazy. They seem like, what? How in the world could that happen? I'm not saying that I get that, okay? But to somehow dismiss them outright, to say, oh, well, that didn't happen. That's, that's not possible. Okay, let me, let's back that train up for just a second. If we can believe that God created the world, if you can get to that point, if you can believe God created it, you don't think he can make a fish swallow somebody? I mean, I'm just saying, I know it's not normal. I know that it, I get it, but, but it's at least possible if you believe in a supernatural God, it's at least possible. So, so I, you know, I won't spend too much time on that. But I believe that there are so many things in the Bible that are historically accurate, we have to at least give it its due. Psalms 34, I'm sorry, Psalms 33, verse 4. Listen to this. For the word of the Lord is right and what? True. True. It didn't say untrue. It said true. And so when you read the scriptures, you can trust that it's true. Now, there, uh, there are some proofs to this. And so if you are a, a historian, now historians have come up with three things that are essential for it to be historically accurate. I mean, these are important. And so, so in, just in the discipline of historian world, right, that's, these are the things that they say have to be there in order for something to be historically accurate. So number one is they have to have eyewitness accounts. There has to be eyewitness accounts that say that something is historical. Guess what the Bible is? It's eyewitness accounts of people seeing things and, and being there and watching them. And so if like, just look at the four gospels. You have four different gospels that are saying the same thing. And they're all coming from a different perspective, but they're saying thematically the same thing. Which, if you study probability, there's not a good chance that's going to happen. It wasn't like they were sitting in the same room saying, did you say and? Yeah, I said and. Did you say but? Yeah, I said but. You see what I'm saying? They didn't, they didn't do that. And so there's a, there's a sense that the thematic 
even the thematic part of the historical accuracy is significant. So that's number one, is that there's an eyewitnesses. Number two, it's recorded and copied with extreme care. I believe that God put the, the, the revelation, the word, the, bre- the breath of God, and he gave it to the Israelite nation for a reason. Because not only were he's chosen people, they are meticulous about what they do. And so these scribes, I mean, it'll blow your mind. Some of you would like, because if you're like me, I would lose my mind if I was ever called to be a scribe. I'm just telling you. I mean, they were so meticulous about what they do. And so, so not only do, when they would transcribe things, so if they were copying a book, right, and a, and a, or a letter into another parchment or something, another scroll, what would happen is these scribes, they wouldn't even copy uh, word for word. They would copy letter for letter. Matter of fact, they would know the count of the letter. So they would know the exact count of all the words. And matter of fact, they would know the middle, the middle letter. And what they would do is they would go from the middle out each side, counting them. And if it didn't come to the right number, they would throw the whole scroll out. That's nutty. And we're not talking about like they were typing on a computer, people. This was tedious work. And it had to be exact. It had to be right. Why? Because it was God's word for people. It had to be. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm not going to go into it because, you know, some of you probably don't care. But maybe you've heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls. These are These things are amazing. And the reason they're amazing historically is because they showed up many, many, many years after the the manuscript, the earliest manuscript that they had. Does that make sense? So there was an early manuscript. These things showed up many, many years later. And what's cool about it is they pull them out of a cave, right? And and, And you have the scroll of Isaiah. And what they do is they start to look at it and guess what they do? They start looking at the number and they go to the middle and they figure out that that one, which is many, many years later, is exactly correspondent word for word. Every bit of it is the same as the earliest manuscript that they had. Guys, that isn't a coincidence. There, I, I'll get to the math in just a second. That's just absolutely mind blowing. And so it's so important that you understand that our faith is based in history. It is accurate. And so eyewitness recorded copies with extreme care. And then number two, archaeological confirmation. So in other words, it happened. There's results from it. Like, wow, a pot. I see that pot. And that pot was over here in the book. You know, I'm, you know it's not a pot, but you get my point. That there's a historical piece. Like here, I'll give you one. One of the big arguments about the inaccuracy of the Bible was that, that, and it was there for a long time, and and many people would say that, well, that proves it, is that there was this group of people called the Hittites, because there was no historical act, there was no historical evidence that the Hittites had ever, ever lived. But guess what? (laughs) Not too long ago, they dug some stuff up and they found trove, treasure troves of information saying that the Hittite that the Hittites actually exist. You know what that does? It plants the revelation of God in history. Like this is not fake stuff. And so it's so important we understand that with even just the basics of historical uh, 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 standards or principles, the Bible meets every one of them. The Bible absolutely meets every one of them. And I think that's kind of a big deal. That our faith is based in history. Jesus really lived. He wasn't just a good idea. He wasn't just a a good teacher that had good ideas. Matter of fact, oh, he doesn't even need to exist because we just follow his teachings. No, it matters that he lived. It matters that he was a human being, that he came to this world, he died on a cross, and that he beat death. That matters. It matters because, see, when our history doesn't enhance our faith, there's a problem, and vice versa. But the good news is about the Bible is you can trust it. You can trust that it's there. And anybody that tells you it's not, they don't know what they're talking about. Don't buy it. Because (laughs) there are some really smart men and women that have defended the faith for many, many, many years. And just because somebody becomes a bathroom prophet in your life doesn't mean they're right. Some of you get that? 
Bathroom prophet? All right, I didn't know if you got it. <laughs> so it's historically accurate. Number two, it is scientifically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. Now, you say, well, how is that possible? Well, God created the universe. He created the universal laws. And so whatever science is discovering, they've been discovering what God did. They've been discovering the universal laws that were set up by God. And now here's the thing I know. The word of God isn't changing. It's always consistent. It's the same as it always has been. But guess what does change? Science. Science changes all the time. Now, and a matter of fact, if it's, a, if it's good science, it's willing to change. Good science is willing to change based on the evidence in front of it. And it's the people that, that give these outlandish hypotheses that have no uh, support in scientific method that are the problem. And so it's important we see that science is changing all the time, but the word of God is not. And if you say, well, how is that possible? Well, go back and read your third grade science book. I can guarantee you it's changed. Guarantee it. And so science is always changing. But listen to this. Listen to this in Psalm 148, 5 and 6. I love this. Watch this. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord. For, look at this. He issued his command. And they came into being. I like that. God creates out of nothing. There's this fancy word in Latin, ex nihilo. Isn't that good? It, 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 it means it, it came out of nothing. It didn't come from something. Science comes from something. God creates out of nothing. And so you see him saying that it came into being. Then watch this. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. You can take that to the bank. That is something you can build your life on. You don't have to update the Bible. The Bible doesn't need to be updated. It's fine just the way it is. Science is always changing, always being updated. If it's good science, it's always being adjusted. But the Bible, the Bible is not a science book. It was never intended to be a science book. <laughs> it has no interest in being a science book. Matter of fact, back in the 18, 1800s or, or 1861 in France, lots of crazy things were happening in France. All right. But, but, but it was an age of reason. But in 1861, uh, the French... Um, the French Academy of Science put out this article, and this was the article. 51 incontrovertible, God, that's such a hard word. 51 incontrovertible scientific facts that prove that the Bible is wrong. Well, wasn't that nice of them? Yeah? The cool thing is, is that all 51 of those incontrovertible scientific facts have been incontroverted. I like that. That all, you know, that's my boy. He's like, oh, these are incontrovertible. Oh, are they? Yeah, sure they are. But they've been, dis they've been disproven. You see, God's stuff stays true. God's stuff is real. It's not changing. It's something that lasts. And that's what I love about God. Is I can build my life on that. You know, the, the Bible, I think, says so much about what God has done. And I also think it says uh, a variety of things about science. Uh, matter of fact, I think, uh, what, what, what are the things that the Bible doesn't say that we've said? Get that. Get this. So, so, in other words, we have to change our perspective a little bit. Here, I'll give you an example. And this was known in history, and you've probably read this somewhere in your history books. But at one point, we humans, smart people, were super smart people, right? We believed that the earth was flat. Now, I know if I say that in this room, you'd be like, oh, you're a dummy. But back in the old days, long time ago, they believed that the earth was flat. Isn't that crazy to think about? They actually believed that. But here's the thing. And it wasn't until Copernicus shows up and says, ah, I don't think it's flat. And they're like, hmm, we need to kill him. Because <laughs> that's usually what happened. You know, somebody has a new idea. Yeah, we got to kill that guy. <laughs> He's gone too far. Right? But listen to this. Listen to this. This is an Isaiah. This is an Isaiah which was written many years before. Watch this. An Isaiah, it says this. Um, shoot. Where are you? There it is. Isaiah 40, 22. God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Circle of the earth. That word is sphere, where we get the word globe. So why the world was thinking that the world was flat, God was already saying in his word that it is not. And if we would have just read Isaiah, we would have known. And we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. 
So, so not only did we think the world was flat, but we thought the earth was being held up by something. That was one of the things, is that the earth was somehow being held up by something. So like the Greeks, for example, they had mythology that said, you know, there was this guy named Atlas. And Atlas would hold up the globe. Remember that guy like leaning down has the globe up? That, that was Atlas. That was how they explained how th this thing stayed up. You go to the Hindus. The Hindus had like a, <laughs> they had an elephant on top of a turtle, on top of a serpent. <laughs> and the globe was held up by all of those animals. Enjoy that. <laughs> the Egyptians, super smart. Right? They did amazing things. Mathematical genius type people with the things that they did. But they thought the earth was lifted up or, or held up by five pillars. Moses was trained in that. Get that. He was in Egypt. He was trained in that. And when he wrote the first five books of the Bible, he didn't say that. Go all the way back to Job, which is the oldest book in the Old Testament. Watch this. This is what the Bible says. I love this. He spreads out the northern skies over the empty space. And watch this. He suspends the earth over what? Nothing. No pillars. No elephants and turtles. No atlas. God suspended it. Guys, that's powerful. It's powerful that you know that the Bible's already teaching. If these people would have just read the Bible, they'd have been better off. They'd have been better off. So watch this. Did you know that one time they thought that they could count the number of stars? So, you know, there was a guy named Copernicus. And, and, and he said, you know what, guys? I've done it. I did it. I counted all the stars. I got them. And he, and he said, okay, here's the number. 1,022. <laughs> this is super smart guy. 1,022. That's how many stars are up there. Well, then a guy comes along named Ptolemy. Ptolemy is like the father of like astronomy. So he shows up and he says, okay, that guy's so messed up. He totally missed the boat on that deal, right? And he says, I've got it, I've got it. It's 1,026. <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, these are real things. I'm not making this stuff up. Well, listen to this in Jeremiah 33, 22. The stars of the sky cannot be counted. I like that. I like it. Just read the Bible. You, you can get a lot of scientific knowledge out of the Bible. It's, it's, it's there. Now, I don't know if you know this, but back in, you know, I, I forget my dates. Too many dates in my head right now. But bubonic plague, remember that? Yeah, killed a lot of people. Wiped a lot of people out. Well, they didn't understand something. They didn't understand something called contagions. They didn't understand uh, blood. They didn't understand some of those things, right? And so there was a guy... Um, how do you say his name? Hypro, hyprocrates, hyprocrates. Uh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's an important guy, right, to medicine. But he had something called humoralism, right? And humoralism basically said that there were five things that really affected the human body that needed to be addressed. One was yellow bile, one was black bile, which I don't even know what that is, uh, phlegm, and blood. So these were the things that needed to be addressed. You know, so, so that's why you get something called uh, bloodletting. Remember that in history? They'd cut people and bleed them out because they thought they had to get the blood out of them because the blood was actually what was making them sick. Our first president of the United States was killed because of bloodletting. Like they, they cut him three times. They did it three times. And at the third time he died because they were letting blood because he was sick. He had heart problems. And so they thought, eh, well, we'll just bleed him out. Well, not smart. <laughs> That's where them leeches come in. Remember, like you put the leeches on them and suck the blood out? Weird. I'm, you're not putting no leech on me. <laughs> Leviticus 17, 11, watch this. So the book that no one ever goes to, they try and avoid Leviticus at all costs. Leviticus 17, 11, look at this. For the life of the body is in the blood. It doesn't say you got to get rid of the blood. Matter of fact, we figured out that the life of the body is in the blood and we do things called transfusions now. You got to get them more blood because if you don't, they're going to die. And matter of fact, they, they've done it in such a way where they, they can replace all your blood at some point. Just, you know, they get it all in there and get some good stuff in there. But the life blood is in there. The life of the body is in the blood. The Bible knew that. Get this. 
Then watch this. This is even better. When I was talking about contagions and people being quarantined, look at this in Leviticus 13, 4. The priest will quarantine, quarantine the person for seven days. Huh. They knew something, didn't they? They knew something. If we would have just read the Bible, we would have probably saved a lot of lives during the bubonic plague. Could have isolated some people. I'm sorry. I love you. But, you know, here's some food. But you got to stay away from the healthy people because you're going to kill them. I mean, it's hard, it's hard, but it's true. And the Bible knew it. You know why the Bible knew it? Because, see, God wrote it. God wrote it before we knew, before we understood, before we could even fathom the depths of what he had created, this universe. We, he already knew. And he gave it to us in advance. That's how much he loves us. I like that. Psalms, Psalm 12, 6, watch this. And the word of the Lord is what? It's, it, it, they're all flawless, flawless like silver purified in the crucible, like gold refined seven times. Man, that's good news. It's historically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. And then finally, this will probably be the only one I'm able to get to because I have seven. I don't know if I told you that. I do. But I think we're going to get this third one in. But this third one will blow your mind. It's prophetically accurate. It's prophetically accurate. And that's not just talking about someone saying something to you like, hey, you need to change your life. And they're like, okay. Where they speak a word into your life and you change because, no, this is prophecy at the level that they're speaking the future, that they're, they're, they're predicting the future, okay? So, so here's, the, here's the thing you got to get. There are a thousand prophecies foretold that have already come true. A thousand. That's a lot. But get this, 300 of those are about Jesus alone. And they were prophesied 400 years before he even existed. That should make you go, Oh, I didn't, I didn't feel like I had the effect in the room. That, that, that should make you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because see, and it wasn't like prophecies like a man came through a gate and he walked down the street sideways <laughs> with a goat. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't this, this vague kind of... Ugh. You know, it wasn't Nostradamus. It was, it was real. It was, it was detailed. Some of the details about Jesus 400 years before he even existed, it, it will blow your mind. Matter of fact, King David, who lived many, many years before Jesus even showed up, prophesied how Jesus would be killed by crucifixion. And at that time in history, it didn't even exist as a form of execution. That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, that's pretty good information. That's pretty good. I mean, I, I'm starting to trust this book a little. I'm starting to think that maybe this book can be trusted. And maybe all the things that people are saying, they may not know what they're talking about. Matter of fact, there was a guy named Peter Stoner, which is an unfortunate name, isn't it? Well, for some of you, you might like it. But Peter Stoner, Peter Stoner was a guy who studied what's called probability. Okay, he studied probability. So what he did is he got these 600 experts in a room, and, and their job was to do all of these experimentations on probability. And so let me explain it to you. So if you have uh, a bowl, and in that bowl you have uh, seven balls, okay? And, and uh, nine of those balls are yellow, and one of those balls is red. Making sense? The probability of pulling the red ball out of that would be one in ten, Right? So that would be the probability of pulling the red ball out of that bowl. And so what they did is they did probability studies on the prophecies of the Bible. And they started to kind of try and calculate and compute mathematically how crazy or how hard it would be for some of these things to actually happen. And so just taking like, let's say eight, let's say eight, eight of those prophecies, right? If one person, one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power, which is a big old number. <laughs> that is a big number. I don't even know what that number is. You know, it's probably a quad, quadruplet or something. It's a big number, people. So, so you have this big number. And again, that's only eight, if eight prophecies were true. I just said a thousand. 
Four, 300 for Jesus. Okay. So eight prophecies were true. That is the probability of that actually happening. So let me give you a better context because you're like, wow, that's a big number. Thanks. But here you go. Imagine if that number was calculated in silver dollars. Okay. So we have silver dollars and we need to put those silver dollars in some kind of container. So we're going to pick the state of Texas. All right. So Texas becomes our container. And so we're going to put silver dollars in Texas and you have to fill it two feet height across the entire state of Texas. Silver dollars. You with me? That's a lot of silver dollars. OK. You put a guy in a helicopter in Oklahoma and he's flying south to Texas and he's just flying along. And at one point he says, I think this is good. And so he reaches his hand down into two feet of quarters or silver dollars and he's able to pick the red one out. And there's only one red one. That, my friends, would be a feat. Some might even say improbable, not even possible, right? Only of eight of them, eight prophecies. Now, I'll give you a few more just for fun. But what if a person had maybe fulfilled 16 prophecies? Well, that would be one in 10 to the 45th power. That screen doesn't have enough width to hold the zeros that would cave. Then watch this. If one person did 48 prophecies, just 48. One in 10 to the 157th power. That's a lot of silver dollars trying to find that one. And my point is to say to you, you can trust the Bible. It's possible with God. When God says something, it matters. When people write down God's word and they get it right, which I believe the Bible is right, you can trust it. God doesn't change. He's not twisted or conflicted or worried or, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to do with these people. No, no, no. That's why we can trust the Bible. That's why the Bible is so important. Because see, how in the world would that, how is that possible? How is it possible for that to even be true? Look at this. Look at this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Look at this. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. It's not about humans. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See? It's because it came from God. That's why you can trust the Bible. That's why you can trust the revelation. That's why you can believe that it was breathed by God. You can trust it because it's true, because God is true. Look at this in Matthew 26, 56. It says, but, but all of this happened to fulfill the words of the prophets as they were recorded in Scripture. The Old Testament communicated about Jesus. The whole story has been pointing towards Jesus from the very beginning. And all of these prophecies are coming true. And that, my friends, is something that we can hold to, that we can believe in, that, can, that we can build our life on. Now, there are some prophecies that haven't come true. And here's the thing I know. You do not want to be on the wrong side of those prophecies. Get that? Because, see, there are some prophecies that Jesus is coming back. And he's given people time and he's given people opportunity to say, yes, I believe I'm in. I, I accept this gift that Jesus has given me. And so we have to understand that there are some prophecies that haven't happened yet. And we have to make sure that we're on the right side of those. But listen to this in, 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 in Revelation 22, 6. It says, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. See, the angel just told you, trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspired the prophets, sent his angels to show his servants the things that must soon take place. So there have been things that have taken place and there are things that will take place. And our job is to get it right. And the way you get it right is you finally say, you know what? I believe this is the word of God. And I believe this story is for me. And I believe what Jesus did on my behalf is for me. And I need to put my faith and trust in that because this stuff's real. This is not some guy sitting in a room making stuff up. This isn't like some guy just found a book under a rock somewhere. Or you know what I'm saying? A lot of those cults, that's what happens. The guy found it, you know, like Mormonism, for example. That guy was sitting out under a tree one day and came home with a book. Nope. I'm out. I'm out. I'm not into that. This, my friends has been here a long time. 
And it's been proving itself true over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, here's the deal. I don't have much more time, but, but I do want to say this. I believe this 100%. I think the Bible teaches it, is that Jesus trusted the Bible. He trusted the Old Testament scriptures very clearly. Even before the New Testament was even written, he was quoting from it. He was, he was sharing about it. He was telling people how he was the f- fulfillment of that. And so I, I've always said this. Look, if you're going to trust somebody, you might as well trust Jesus. You know what I mean? Like if Jesus is telling you something, you should probably be like, that's probably pretty good. I'll take that. I mean, just think, I would rather be wrong with Jesus than right with the world. I'm just saying, that's just my opinion. You, you, you can choose whatever you want. But I think for me, that's what I want. I'm, I believe that he is who he says he is. He's done what he says he's done. And he'll do what he says he'll do. I believe that 100%. And I hope that becomes the story of your life. But I want to I wanna put that, uh, the Bible quote up. The Bible is the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book ever in history. Ever. But here's the deal. Still standing. Still standing. Everybody and their dog has tried to put it down, but it's still there. And it's still bringing truth. And it's still right. And it's still real. So that's why you got to see it. That's why your history matters. It helps you see that stuff. When everything else is changing, like in our world, it changes so fast. Our world changes so quickly. There's a new idea that just pops up here, and a new idea, and a new idea. But the scripture helps to ground us in something that's real. Helps us to see what's really real. Now, I don't know. There's this guy in, in history. Uh, he has a lot of fancy names. He was a French man by the name of Voltaire, which, that's a great name. I'm just saying. I want people to be like, hey, it's Voltaire. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> but Voltaire was not a believer. He did not believe in God. And matter of fact, he worked against uh, the faith in, in many ways. But Voltaire is quoted as saying this, within 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. He lived, I don't know, 1800s or something, whatever it is, 1900s. So within 100 years, the Bible will be forgotten. The ironic thing about this is after he died, um, the French Bible Society moved into his house. (laughs) I like that. That makes me laugh. Because see, the Bible's true. And people can say whatever they want to say. And they can fight against it. But I believe this, and I've seen this true in my life, and maybe you have it in yours, is that truth and time go hand in hand. It just really happens that way. That over time, you'll see what's true. And the Bible has always been true. And it will help you in your life if you allow yourself to be put under its authority. But I want to share this phrase with you. I think this is where our choice is. What is going to be the final authority in my life? The word or the world? And the world says all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, when I'm looking for grounding, when I'm looking for a place to build my life, am I going to allow myself to be under the authority of the word, which I believe is the word of God? Is that going to be true in my life? Not what somebody says, not what your friend says. Because, you know, sometimes we go to our friends quicker than we go to the word. We pick up the phone. Hey, I'm struggling. Help me. Well, why don't you pick up the word first? Let the word, let the Holy Spirit get on you before you make that phone call. And you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. But that's your choice today. I love you enough to say that. That's your choice. Is that you get to pick either the word or the world. I hope you pick the word. Because I believe 100% it'll be a better guide to you than the word or than the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you. You're so good to us. Thank you for this, this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what it means to each one of us. God, we need your help. We need your help. We can't become who you want us to become if we don't figure this out. And so, Lord, right now, I'm just praying for everybody in this room. If, if you're here today and you're in this room and you're like, you know what? I want to get this right. I really want to have the word in my life. I want to submit myself to its authority. I don't want to keep listening to the world. I need it in my life. Would you today be willing to commit yourself by faith 
to reading the Word of God five minutes a day. Just five minutes a day. Every day. Five minutes. If that's you, if that's you, I want to pray for you right now. And so, I'm going to pray a prayer. And you just agree with the prayer and you receive it, okay? Lord God, I am committing myself right now by faith to read your word at least five minutes a day because I want to get it in me so that I can know what's true. Help me, Holy Spirit, to fulfill this commitment. Now, earlier I talked about how there were some prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled. And how we don't want to be on the wrong side of those prophecies. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, I feel like it's an important time for us to make some decisions. Because see, the Bible says that, that we don't have another day granted to us or given to us. This is the day we have. And the Bible very clearly says that Jesus came into this world to save us, to set us free from the bondage that we've been in, that we could be restored back to the Father. And the way that he did that is he went to a cross and he died for our sins. And it was there in that moment as he breathed his last breath that he was buried for three days in a tomb. And let me tell you, that was a temporary tomb. Because three days later, he came out of that tomb and sin and death was beaten. And a bridge was created for you to get back to God. I don't know if that's true of your life. I don't even know if you've accepted that. But the Bible says that if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has done what he says he's done, that he will save you and set you free. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm gonna ask you to take a step of faith today. I'm not gonna ask you to come down front or I'm not gonna point you out, but I do want to give you the opportunity to put, put, put this right with God, to be assured of your salvation today. And all I'm gonna ask you to do in just a moment, on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to put your hand up as a statement of faith. And again, nobody's looking around, nobody's gonna point you out, but I wanna be able to pray specifically for you, okay? And so right now, by faith, be bold, by faith, on the count of three. One, two, three. Go ahead. Go ahead right now. Raise them up. Raise your hands. Go ahead. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. Good job. Don't wait. Today's your day. Right now. Good, good. All right. Church, nobody's going to pray alone in here. We're all going to pray together. And so right now, if you raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer, but church, let's join in on it. Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Save me today. I surrender myself to you. Be my Lord. Change me from the inside out. Give me a hope and a future in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's celebrate those that made decisions. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you.